All right. Uh, I think it's about time. So uh, my name is Jonah Graham. I work at Kitchener Coders. I'm a CDT committer, and I'm going to tell you about CDT latest and greatest, and uh, CDT past as well. So CDT has been around for, for quite a long time. It was one of the first non-Java projects that was part of the Eclipse. So it has, it's been around for a very long time. There hasn't been many talks in the last few years about it. So some of the newest stuff isn't the newest neon stuff. Some of the new stuff is just stuff you might not have seen before. And I, I hope you enjoy seeing it. Um, I wasted most of my time demoing features. Um, and normally demos, when you see these demos, they have some small pre-canned examples. They work really nicely. But I thought I'd just do a bit more interesting. I wanted to, to show a, a much larger application. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Python, but uh, the, the Python interpreter itself is written in C. So I thought I'd pull the Python sources in and show uh, editing and debugging the Python interpreter itself and how to do that with Eclipse. So, so I switch over to the demo. I've uh, lost a bit of screen resolution, but we should manage. Anyway, I think it's a, a few too many toolbars there, but uh, we'll, le we'll leave them because I like the one at the top. So uh, if you haven't seen the launch bar yet, um, I, I highly recommend it. it. It really eases a lot of the a lot of the workflows. <coughs> now, the, uh, the first thing we're talking about is the scanner. Now, you may not know what the scanner is, but the scanner is the part of CDT that finds all of your sources so that it can generate the index. The index is the, all, of the, all of the files, the functions, everything in your code. Getting the scanner right is sometimes a non-trivial task. For a small pro project, it's easy. So I thought I'd say, well, it can be done. Here's, here's, it, here's it being done for Python. It took a few minutes to do. I know what I'm doing. It took maybe 15 or 20 minutes for me. It will take you a bit longer if you haven't done it before. But once you get up to speed, um, you'll, 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 you'll be able to do it a bit faster. And once you have CDT configured, that's when you get the full power of it. So I'll do is I'll show you a little bit about how to configure it and how I've configured it in this project. So the settings are all in the, the project properties. And the, the, key, the key one to make everything work is the C, C++ general, preprocessor include paths, and the macros and everything like that. So what I can see is how we're currently configured. So for the, today I'm focused on C. So this is all of the different plugins to Eclipse that provide information on how to do the scanning. Um, so you can provide your own entries. <coughs> you can ref get entries from all the projects you reference, but my Python project doesn't have any, referenced, any uh, reference projects. You can use the build output parser. Now this is one that I've used today to, to generate it. And that is I simply did a build of Python within Eclipse. And Eclipse will scan all of your command lines. It'll see the GCC. It'll see the dash Ds. It'll see the dash Is. It'll collect all that information and use that to figure out where all the sources are to analyze. Uh, that's, a, that's, that's a great way to, to, to get it up and running quickly. For the Python project, it's actually a, a pretty simple project in its configuration, thankfully. The, the only include directories are the root of the project, which is showing up as an empty string here, and the include directory within the project. There's a few macros that it were, were identified on the command line, although the, these ones probably won't actually matter to, to the project. Um, so I mentioned there's different providers. One of the other providers that's important is the, the built-in ones that for, for GCC before you get the project involved. So CDT will run off, run GCC, and ask it for all the macros that GCC will define, all the include paths it uses, and it uses that to populate here so you can see. You can see user include, this, you know, your key one. But you can see all the dash defines that GCC is using, and those will you know, likely affect which parts of your code are enabled or not enabled. We'll see in a little bit, you know, we're not on Windows here, so the Windows bit of the code should show up disabled. You can configure those providers over on, on the second tab. And so this is the one where the, the build out. But and see, it's looking for GCC. It's looking for G++. It's looking for C-Lang if you're using that. 
and there's a number of other settings. I'm not going to go into too much more detail. Some of the stuff has been around for a while. Um, I just wanted to make sure you, you'd seen that it's here because it can be quite frustrating when you get all those little red error markers in your workspace because you don't have your project configured quite right. Now, let's see. Okay, so all of that is done per, per project, per, per tool chain. So for my Python one, I have a python.h, and you see that's, that's a, you know, one of the, well, quite a lot of header files in the, in, the, in the Python source code here, and then there's more of them hidden in other places as well. But it has an includes stdio.h. Now if I open it, fortunately, it's only open stdio.h. However, at the same time, I happen to be debugging a small ARM project over here, <coughs> which uses an ARM, a GCC for ARM, which means it has a different library. And when I navigate to stdio.h for that one, as you can observe, these are different stdio.h's. Um, you can see that the, uh, this one has new lib in it because it's the new lib library, and that one here has is the, the standard user include. So all, all these things are kept separate, and if you look at those same build settings for, for the ARM project, you'll see that it is discovered set settings will have all of the, the ARM include pass, all the ARM settings somewhere in here. You see all the ARM architecture stuff. And that really important to get, to get the scanner to work right. But the scanner is really the means to the ends. It's not, it's, it's not what you're, what is it? On its own, it doesn't do anything. It just finds everything you want to generate you a really good index. Now, what you could do is, especially if you're extending CDT, you're creating it for your own compilers, you're creating it for your own environments, you can actually write your own providers. So when you ship it to your customers and they're just creating their projects, they can have this stuff just work automatically so they don't have to worry ab about configuring it for, for, for your environment. Since you already know what your environment is, you know, if, you're, if you're creating you know, company X tool chain, you can set all this stuff up as, and provide it to, to your end users. All right. Now, the, um, the other part that you might run into when you're using CDT is the, the, the code analysis. Now, the most likely most of your error messages you'll see in code analysis are related to not finding the right things in the <coughs> scanner. But there's, a, there's some other stuff, and a really key, nice and new one is in Neon, we can disable individual code and error messages and warnings. That, that's quite important, especially if you're working with a large legacy code base or, or something where code end just doesn't get it right. And so I'll, I'll show you a, a, sh a small example of this new feature in, in Neon. So. Now, this is, a, this is a pretty minor example, but it's to give you an idea. Now, Kodan here has said, this is a suspicious semicolon sitting all by itself. Now, this is the style that the Python coders like. Um, so you could, put, you could put a comment saying you intended it. And you just say, suppress the suspicious semicolon and now your warning has gone away. And I've, I've added about half a dozen of these settings in, in the Python code where Codan, Codan and the Python developers haven't completely agreed. Now you, you can configure these, these error messages and you can find, find out what they are, uh, the suppression messages I mean, by going into preferences and configuring Codan. So if you go into C and C++ and code analysis, you'll see all of the different code analysis options that they're there. So, you know, a, a, a good example of one that you, that's really quite useful is assignment and condition. Now, if you want to see how to suppress it, when you really did want to do an assignment in your condition instead of a, an equals equals in your condition, this is the, the, the comment you need, at suppress assignment and condition. Now, as you can see, this is actually an editable field, and you can say, well, actually, I just want to type suppress on that. I don't want to have to type exactly the message. And you can just set all of them 
if you desire. So if I just take a few of them here. Set, set all of these ones to at suppress. And then I can use at suppress everywhere without having to know the specific error message. So it depends on what level of fine tuning you want. You may also find that actually you just want to turn some of these messages off completely because you might do it all over your code and you really just don't agree with code end, the code end decisions. Um, or you have some very complicated macros that code end actually doesn't really see all the way into some generated code and stuff. So you can just turn them right off. And then you can really end up with um, you know, a warning error free code that you can navigate. So that's a little bit on, on, set, on setting up your C editor, your C indexer. But let me show you how to actually, you've gone through that effort. Let me show you why you went through that effort now. So you can actually look at the, um, the, the C, C++ index. You can navigate your code. And there's, there's a few ways to do it. And I'll show you some, some you may have seen and some you might have not seen. One of them is the include browser. Now the include browser allows you to walk the tree of includes up or down. So I'm going to start with the main Python include, include header, python.h. That's where it includes pretty much everything. So if I choose this option here that says show all the files that python.h includes, and I can navigate and walk down that tree, see, see what, what else there is in there. And I can also find out everyone that includes python.h quite easily. So I can see all, all of these modules, however many dozens there are here, are all including python.h. And that's all made, made possible by the, by the indexer. Now, there's another view which will show you everything that's in the index, just show you details about every part of the index. Um, so for my, that little tiny ARM program I had, I had exactly one public method called main. So if I expand ARM, you see main. But I can also show all, the, all of the symbols that are available in the entire pro to the program by turning externally defined symbols on. <coughs> and then you'll be able to see all the printf you go. You can click on it and navigate right to that header file. You, you can expand it for the Python project. The, the GUI sometimes doesn't keep up. Um, I'll press expand here. Take about four or five seconds. The index is actually accessed quite quickly. It's all, it's all paged. What's slow here is actually, it probably should have been a virtual tree if you're not I don't know if you how familiar you are with plugin development, but you could have a, an actual tree or a virtual tree, and this one probably should have been a virtual tree, so it didn't have to create the entire tree in the first go. Um, but yeah, you can browse the entirety of, of the namespace to your, your whole Python project. So search. Search is a, a great way to access the index. So within the search, you can I'm going to search for this a method, which we'll be looking at a lot through this. This method within Python happens when you do any file dot write. So if you do a print or you do file dot write, this is the method in C that we end up at. And a little bit later, I'll show you debugging how we end up here. So if I do a search on that, on that symbol, it's going to show me all of the uses of that symbol within, within my project. So it's showing me that. The definition of it here, it's showing me the, the use of it here, <laughs> declaring it to, to Python. I don't expect you to, to worry or know about that part, but it's how my, Python works internally with modules. Now, the next great thing is you want to be able to see call hierarchy. So if you right click on, on a symbol, you can show call hierarchy. Now, if, you're, if you've been doing Java programming with JDT, you're probably quite used to this, but you do have this in CDT as well. Um, you can see, you can have fields, fields of variables on or off. So this, this method, the only place it's actually used is in this struct construction. So if I have the fields off, it looks like no one's calling it. Turn fields on, you can see, well, actually, a reference to it is here in this, in this array. I can also see everyone that file a, a IO write is calling. And there's an interesting one here called pi arg parse tuple. So 
when I get to it, I can choose that one, I can focus on it, and I can see everything that pi r parse tuple calls. And more importantly to me, if I'm trying to figure out how to use it, is I can see everyone who's calling it and see if some of them give me an indication on, on how I can use it if I'm having trouble, for example. All right, so that's call hierarchy. All right, now the call hierarchy really starts coming in useful when you're in C++. So C is nice, you can pretty much grep everything in C. Symbols are nice and unique, apart from statics, but pretty close. But here I have a case with C++ where I have an overloaded method, one take an int, one take a double. If I do the call hierarchy on, on that, you can see the int one, it will show me just the place where it's called with an int. I show the call hierarchy <coughs> on the double, you'll see just the place it's called with a double. Um, that's where, that's where that, the call hierarchy comes very, comes very useful. All right. So let's do, let's do some debugging. So I've already, I've already built Python. So let's run it up and see, see what happens. So first I'll just run it using the, the launch bar. So I've, I have my launch configuration configured. It's just running Python within the project. And here we are. Running, it's running Python, nothing, nothing too spectacular there. But let's start debugging it, because that's where it gets a bit more interesting. So, so I'll change it to debug. It's going to stop on main when we first enter. Go over to debug. Um, and so, run to line. Right click or press control R and choose run to line. We're in here. Now here's a here's a, a great a great feature that not, not everyone knows about. I want to step into pi mem roster dump, but I don't really want to step into set lo set locale. That's the C library, I'm sure it's right. So if I do a, a step into, I'm going to end up in a set locale, and then I have to step out of it. And if there's lots of these, I might have to step in and out five or six times for a single statement before I get to where I really want. Let me start that again so I can get back to just before I step the wrong way. Run to the line. Now, if I right click on this PyMeb roster dump and choose, where is it now? Step into, oops, it's here somewhere. Step into selection, I can go right into it. Although normally I press Control, Alt, and click on it, and that, and that does it a bit more easily. Gives, gives me the, the high, I click on that, and you see I'm stepping directly into PyMed roster dump. It's already stepped into set locale, stepped out, and stepped into to this method. So. Yeah, same available in the Java debugger, yeah, so, and, and uh, I, I, I assume other debuggers have it as well, I, I'd hope so. It's, it's one of those little things in Eclipse that makes it really useful. In Java, it tends to be, Java and uh, object-oriented programming in general tends to be more useful because you end up having these, an individual function call which will call a.get0, a.get1, a.get2, but really you don't, those are all trivial get methods. You don't really want to look at them. You just want to get to the, to the meat of the, of the problem. All right, so. While we're, while we're debugging over here, let's, let's show some disassembly. Ready a little bit of screen space, but we should be okay. Now, so, disassembly view, absolutely essential for us embedded programmers out there, probably less so for, uh, for desktop. The disassembly view in CDT is really nice. One of the things I, I really like about it, let's just find a, a good example here, is that it, it does this fading out into the background of the instructions as you, as, you, as you step past them. So it's showing this darkest green one is where we are now. The slightly less dark is going back in time. And one nice new feature in Neon is if you hover over um, 
a register, it's going to show you the register value. So what save you having to open up another view for a quick look. So, we're going to put a breakpoint on, oops, I forgot, which line is my breakpoint supposed to be at? File, I don't know. I'm going to show you the memory browser. So, I'm just going to put a breakpoint, I have my breakpoint. <coughs> All right, so, now we're, we're running Python and we're doing it in debug mode. So, if I do my print as I did before, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at this file I.O. a couple of times. We're going to end up in file I.O. right over here. And we're just about to pass over to this, the, you know, the actual C library, lowest level, not C library, below that, right to say write my data. Now, if I want to examine that a little bit, I can show the memory, open the, up the memory browser, and I can go pbuff. Dot buff and see <coughs> so I, as you can see I can see my hello ECF I typed over my console here didn't have it so I typed hello ECF not terribly surprising it showed up as hello ECF over here in where it's, where it's just about to do the write now this memory browser can do quite a lot of other clever things and one of the nice new features is if you give it the address of, of the stack pointer, so $SP in this case, it's going to sh let me browse my stack. And it's going to show me where all my local variables which are on the stack, where they're stored in memory. So if I go to my top of my stack, so you can see here are all my local variables. There's my pbuff, which has a pointer to the buffer, which is somewhere else, and all my, other, all my other locals. And as I walk up and down the stack, you can see it's highlighting the, the, next, the next part down the stack. But that's a really nice new feature that was added. Yes? Are all these features also available when you do remote debugging? Um, I don't know whether all of them are, but I believe most of them should be. I, I don't think there's anything about this one which, which would prevent it from working in remote debugging. Mm -hmm. This is a, a new feature in Neon, so I encourage feedback. If, if it doesn't work exactly as you expect, you tell us so we can make it work exactly as you expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I hope it does. <laughs> I, I hope it was in, in, in all the cases that it's that's supposed to, yes. Yeah. Yes, because this is for embedded. I mean, like th th this type of examining the stack like this, you know, well, it's not just for embedded, but I, I come from a, a deeply embedded land where I like to see this stuff working really well. So, yeah, that's yeah. 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 All right. Okay, so what's next on my agenda? Okay, so memory. So now, back to my console. So we are, well, we're already at our breakpoint. So we were looking at the pbuff in, we were looking at the pbuff in, uh, in the memory browser, but of course we can look at it in the variables view as well. So if we can make that a bit, give a bit more space for us. So we have pbuff over here. It's a Python type. And, and here, here we look at the buff, and it's great, except that it's a void star. So, it's, so it doesn't know it's a string, doesn't know how to interpret it. It just displays it that. Now if you right-click on, 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 the, on the variable, you can actually cast it to type. So you display it in the type that you're interested in. So if I change it to char star, it will now display nicely hello ECF. And if I want to, give that, if I want to keep that for later, I can right-click on it and choose watch. And now it's, it, it's created a full expression that will be there. So if I, uh, oops, where did my console go? So if I print again, or offend, you'll we'll see that I don't have to do, t do too much effort. It's just right there in my watch window. That's, that's quite useful. A 
Okay, so now that, that's all nice and all, but what, what, what I want to show you is the next level feature. Stopping at this breakpoint to see everything written will have a serious slowdown on how long it takes my code to run. So instead, what I can do is I can, I can put in a, uh, a software trace using GDB's uh, dynamic printf feature. So in my file I.O., instead of having a regular breakpoint, I can create a dynamic printf breakpoint. And just before I do that, I'm going to get the expression so I don't have to rewrite it now. So if I create a, a dynamic printf, you could put printf style string. So I'm just going to record here that we're doing a write, which file descriptor we're writing to, the length of the string, and, and, uh, and how many, and, and the actual string value itself. See, we have a, a different symbol for the printf. And if you look in the breakpoints view, you can see that showing it's got the extra details showing that printf string. So now when I do my debug, let's continue past main. If I do print hello, it's going to print the hello as it did before, and it's also going to do this trace line for me. So the right fd1 len 6 chars hello. And if we debug, um, I have another program here that's got uh, that's got a short program that does writes to different file descriptors. You can see it's showing all the writes, and these are into files, so they're not showing you the standard out. So you. First, I did a message to the user, writing to 10 files, so it's to, to stood out to one. And then I'm opening different file handles and writing, writing to file, 0, writing to file 1, et cetera, all the way down to the end. Okay. Now, so that, that, that's, what, that's some basic debug functionality. Now, this is where I quite like Eclipse, because with an Eclipse, we're not limited to, to just debugging one language. We can debug two languages at the same time. So that short, that short program I, I was just showing you. Short. So here's my, my, my short little demonstration program. You can see I'm opening files repeatedly 10 times, writing, writing to them and flushing. Now, I have a problem, perhaps, with my flush. My data is not showing up at the right time. This is why I'm in there debugging the actual lower level write. So let's launch, let's launch my um, short program with the Python debugger. So I can step through it. Now the Python debugger started. I can step through it fine. But what I really want to do is see what's happening on the C on the C side at the same time. So we're going to attach to that Python run now when I hit continue we're going to see what what happens. So I continue here. Oops, I have to change this back to a a, a regular breakpoint. You see the trace is there but it's not the trace I was trying to show. So now I press resume in my Python side, and now I hit a breakpoint in the C side. I press resume in the C side, and I end up back in the Python side of the, that breakpoint. So I can bounce back and forth and really get, get, get at my program and understand exactly what's happening on both sides. And you can scale this up, throw in Java in there as well. If you have a J and I using JEP and Java all together, why not have three languages? You have to understand a bit what, about what you're doing because while you're stopping one interpreter, it means that the debugger talking to that interpreter might not do exactly what you expect, but when you have these complicated multi-language multi, multi language systems, this gives you a way to, to be able to debug them, and, and CDT makes that possible, because at the end of the day, it seems pretty much everything worked down to the bottom, there, there we see as, as the basis. Okay, so that's, that's what I wanted to show you today for my demo. Let me go and talk about some of the stuff that's 
ongoing. Um, this is just a really interesting one. It's not strictly about CDT, but CET has been around for, for uh, well, CET itself has been around for more than 10 years, but the, the index of CDT that Secure Lead uses has been around for 10 years. Um, it holds a full model, as we've been seeing, and it's quite well implemented. In fact, it's so well implemented that the CDT indexer is actually faster than the JDT indexer, or at least that will, be, will have been the case up until maybe oxygen. So some improvements have already begun in, but the people who did the CDT index are now redoing the JDT index or improving the JDT index. So we're seeing some significant improvements. And, uh, and just yesterday, I saw a check-in permission request go in for putting it into, into oxygen, uh, the next big set of work on the CDT, on work based on the CDT indexes. Oh, that was in the wrong place. Now, I know that a few of you guys in here are actually CDT extenders, and if you're a CDT extender, one of the big changes is, is that the next version of CDT, Neon, that's coming out in a couple weeks, is the first major new version of CDT in over five years. And major new version means we have broken the API a little bit. Now, one place we broke the API in a significant way is we deleted out a large piece of unmaintained code, which was CDI. CDI, if you're not familiar, was a C debugger interface. It was the original C debug interface that was written. And it has, it has its advantages, but it had a lot of limitations. And it, it wasn't scaling to multi-process debug, it wasn't scaling to DSPs or other complicated things. And many years ago already, uh, the DSF, Debugger Services Framework, was written. And that's been the main one used. So uh, this winter, we removed CDI. And if, you have it, if you're using it, you haven't seen that yet, you're going to have to adapt when Neon comes. So if you are still using CDI, you have a couple of choices. Migrate to DSF. It's a bit more complicated, a lot more powerful. Um, if you really are stuck and you need to use CDI, you need to use it for a while, OK? You need to use CDI for a while. Um, consider maintaining your own fork. No one was maintaining CDI in the open source anymore, but we know that a lot of companies were actually still using it. Um, this might be the kick that some companies need to say, well, actually, you know, we're, we're using it. Let's, let's maintain it out in the open. And if you have any troubles in this migration path, a few projects have already come onto the dev forum say, hey, look, your APIs are broken. How, do you, how can you help us migrate? Come, there's a number of people that are willing to answer questions or get in touch with uh, me and Tracy, and, and we can solve that. Um, the, my personal one is, is that I've been working on, and it's finally going to be here in Neon, been at for a while, is improving the source lookup. So if you've ever seen this kind of error message, and then you can't get rid of it because it doesn't matter what you do, you keep debugging, you have it. I've tried to make that substantially better. No one's touched some of this code in five, some eight, nine years. And, and the, the people who originally wrote it mostly aren't, aren't around anymore. So it was a bit of a good exploratory thing to try to rewrite this large piece of code. The results have been quite good. Um, so the exit, that's in Mars. The exit was where something didn't work before a source lookup. Green check marks mean they work now. Linux wasn't too bad. Only half the stuff didn't work. Um, MinGW, compile Linux debug, interaction between platforms, which we're starting to see more and more of. Compile in one OS, debug in another. Maybe you have a, a nice server farm that can compile everything quickly. You want to be able to debug it on Windows. That was a little less. UNC didn't really work in lots of cases. Sigma didn't work. So as you see, we've got lots of green check marks now where, where we had red X's before. So we're going in the right direction. Now, some ongoing features. So I mentioned some of the other new features in the demo, but some ongoing features, which some parts of them are there now, and some parts are, are actively developed code that need more people to get involved <coughs> with, to have a look at, just to test and see if it works in their environment. So what, what is Docker support? So Docker support's been around for a bit, but keep it, we have to keep Docker tooling up to speed with Docker. And so Docker was released, about, the Docker tooling for CDT was released about a year ago, and then this January, Docker updated and made it so the Docker tooling doesn't quite work for debug anymore. So this is, this is why it's, it's an on, ongoing project. Um, 
anyone who's been using GDB for a long time before Eclipse came along, they might have been using it at the console. And they might, they might be really good with the console commands. Eclipse has a pretty good console implementation. However, GDB is implementing a much better version that's going to be integrated into Eclipse in the coming time. So there's a, already a demo of it using GDB 7.12, which isn't released yet, and CDC 9.1, which isn't released yet either. But um, you get a, a, a much more complete um, environment. You get all the, you sh we should be getting all the code completion within in the console. We should get uh, much more consistency. Um, grouping threads is another ongoing project. When we get, we're getting to these massive projects with multiple cores and many threads per core, um, and being able to control just one part of it is what the, group, the grouping feature should do. So you could take the three th threads you're focused on, bring them out, and operate on them as a unit. Macro support, another of my areas, because I, I'm particularly into Python and scripting. Um, we were integrating ease, which is the, the Python scripting, into, into CDT more and more. Um, last year we did the we did the first part of launching support. So if you've ever used the, uh, I think it's called the, the multiple launching within CDT, so you can say, you know, launch two or three different launch configurations automatically with like delays. Um, using scripting, you can get there a lot fast. You can get there a lot faster, a lot more configurable. So you can write a script which la launches your server, waits for it to come up, launches your client, kills your server when your client exits, etc. And then the other big new thing is there's the new build system, which um, mostly Doug is working on, but we're, it's going to finally support CMake properly. Um, a lot of work happening with getting QT to work well. Um, and that's, kind of th th that's an ongoing work, so you should be seeing bits of that. There's some of it in Neon. There'll be more of it in, in, uh, in Neon.1. And this is one that everyone who does multi-core, multi -core, please, June 19th, we're having a call. We're trying to get multi-core breakpoints improved. We want to show where, how it works, show how it applies to the, to the user so that actually debugging multi-core systems is, is easier. And this one's really interesting because, I don't know, no one has really cracked this one yet. So we need to, but I think working as a community, we can really get, do this well. So, uh, CT has got lots of great features. You can do huge projects. You've seen Python, it's more than half a million lines of code. You can do much bigger projects. There's ongoing new features. CT is a very actively made, maintained project. Uh, lots of extenders of, of CDT, which makes it quite unique. It's not just users of CDT. So it's a really good time to get involved with this community. So um, I encourage you to also vote on my talk, but I don't have a slide that says so. So you can vote on my talk. This is the first time I've done a talk by myself. Normally I've had crutches of someone to help me, so uh, any feedback would be, would be appreciated. I know one of the problems, I speak too fast sometimes, so uh, just remember that. I was supposed to think about that the whole time. I only just thought of it now. So are there any questions? <laughs> but, uh, all right. It's not surprising. It's just lunchtime. I'll let you all go to lunch.